How and where should CTV fit into your marketing mix? Hello and welcome to Growth Masterminds, the podcast for growth marketers. My name is John Katsir. Today's a special day for Growth Masterminds. I'm interviewing a former boss, an OG in performance marketing. He's the former CEO of Tune, which kind of literally invented mobile attribution, right? Modern mobile attribution. He's now the head of ad innovation at Roku. Welcome, Peter. Thanks so much for having me. It's going to be fun. Awesome. You know what? I should say your full name because in the intro, I didn't say your full name. Peter Ryan Hamilton. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I recall saying that once at an intro to what did Tune call its, its post back, yeah, post back mm -hmm. exactly. Instead of Alexander Hamilton, uh, exactly. we did Peter Ryan Hamilton. <laughs> exactly, and it was Alex. It was the Hamilton show. The so whole it was musical cool. production. Yeah, <laughs> I Fun still fact. get people stopping me all the time, uh, asking me about post back and those those fun times. Those were great parties. Those were immense. Those were incredible. And fun fact, I mean. Peter was classically trained as an opera singer. So once upon a time, got yes. some voice. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long time ago now, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, it's a fun party trick these days. Uh, it is. It's awesome. It's more than party trick too. We're, we're going to talk a little bit about you and your history, your past as well. We're going to dive into a lot of different things. Uh, what's going on on Roku for ads, uh, performance ads, measurability of those ads, integration with Shopify, your new ads manager, all that stuff and where verticals are working well on Roku right now. I guess I'll start here. Reason I wanted to chat is I do Singular's ROI index. I do Singular's quarterly trends report. Keep seeing CTV platforms and ad networks pop up with greater and greater spend. Uh, there's a bunch of them. Roku's the biggest of them. Uh, it's impressive. There's more share. There's more action. What's going on? Well, um, CTV. Well, so, you know, I, I won't. I won't totally spoil the background bits, but you know, CTV is still in its early stages. And for the last decade, we've watched linear and brand oriented dollars move over to CTV. And that has been the primary growth driver for almost all CTV advertising for that period of time. And now digital is starting to make a move as well. Uh, you're uh, performance marketers and large scale digital marketers have sort of reached, you know, maybe a plateau or reached their uh, opportunity for optimization in search and social. They're looking for alternative channels. They're also, I think, starting to feel the fatigue in their users that direct response can't be the only way they communicate to people. Mm -hmm. uh, not everyone is ready to buy now. Some of them might need a little education. <laughs> Some of them might need to learn about your brand <laughs> before they're ready, you know? And so cultivating that, building a message um, is important. And it turns out that television is one of the best vehicles for doing that. You know, also, I think it feels more native to digital marketers than um, Linear does or did, uh, you know, in terms of targeting and measurement. Uh, the control that you can have in that space it is just like the operating system on your phone or, or your desktop in that way. And so there's a familiar, familiarity there. Um, and, uh, and as a result, a lot of the ad platforms are also trying to build familiar buying methods and make it simple you know, for those marketers to come over. So um, we're seeing a lot of those types of marketers have a lot of success and uh, it's still just early days, but it's going to grow very quickly. Cool. And we're going to chat about that. Uh, we're going to chat about what feels familiar for a performance marketer and mobile performance marketer to come over and to jump on Roku. And we're going to talk about maybe what's a little different as well. Uh, before we get into that, talk a little bit about your journey. I mean, I've known you for, it's gotta be seven, eight years or something like that. Now you were the CEO of tune tune was originally mobile app tracking. If I'm not mistaken, there's has offers. That was a part of there. I mean, this is, this is, this is ad tech, mobile ad tech in the early days, right? Inventing the post back, including the name post back. Um, <laughs> and, and, yeah. and then you did, you did some investing. You did a lot in the Seattle tech ecosystem. Now you're with Roku. Talk about your journey a little bit. Yeah, I'll just say, you know, I grew up, um, my 
my career in tech was through Tune. Um, I was lucky to meet Lucas and Lee, um, our co-founders, and you know, establish this as uh, you know the, one of the first in mobile advertising attribution. And uh, we got to be a part of the beginnings of a new channel and a new market. And that was mobile. You know, it was the year of mobile for the 20 years prior to that. Um, but eventually <laughs> this mobile app install ecosystem, and especially connected to in-app purchasing, connected to lifetime value that came from mobile apps. Mm -hmm. um, when that started to hit and started to make sense, um, we got to help build that economy. And it was an economy built on cost per install. Yep. Um, for, for a very long time. And for many marketers, it still is. Um, but it is, you know, the ability to, you know, spend a dollar and make more than a dollar and do that on a, on a regular basis and make that an evergreen type of channel. And, uh, we got to work with, you know, all of the most incredible marketers and organizations in the world, uh, and, you know, open offices and, you know, nine different countries and, do all kinds of really, really fantastic, wonderful things through that experience. And, uh, you know, going through the sale of Tune, uh, we, we did have two businesses, as you mentioned. So we had two different acquisitions for those two different businesses. Um, it was super interesting on the other side of that. You know, there's, there's definitely a, um, you know, questioning like, who, who am I? What am I doing? <laughs> um, what is, yep. you know, my, my identity, you know, was such a part of, uh, well, was such a part of me was tune. Yeah. And, uh, so I spent some time, you know, took some time off and, and, you know, focused on angel investing and helping out with startups and joining some boards. And, um, and I, and I got a lot of value from that really enjoyed spending time with startups, uh, and still do. Um, but I also, you know, was not really feeling like this is my vocation, you know, at this stage. Now I'm I'll just ready. be a VC, <laughs> right? Yeah. Just pump money into companies. I won't I'm, be a builder anymore. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like, I feel like that's something I can go back to, you know, if that's, if that's something that I, I decide I want to do at some point, yeah. you can, you can always be an investor. Um, so I still want to operate and definitely spend a lot of time thinking about, okay, what does that mean? I have to start another startup and what does that look like? Or am I going to maybe join a startup that, you know, is looking for, you know, a new leader um, and spend a lot of time there and, and dug pretty deeply into those options. Um, didn't find anything that just like hit me. That was like, mm -hmm. yes, I have to do this thing. And I think especially if you are doing early stage and if you're a serial entrepreneur and this is um, not your first time, it, it better be something you really care about. Exactly. You <laughs> know the, the pain. You know the agony yeah. that you're going to be in for. <laughs> yeah. And it's going to be the next 10 years of your life, whichever way you slice it. And uh, so anyway, I did start looking around and thinking about, well, maybe there are some larger companies, or organizations that I'd be interesting, interested in building things at. Um and just looked at different categories. Streaming is something I've long been interested in. We had started to do some measurement and performance measurement studies mm -hmm. uh, at Tune with streaming. And this was even earlier days <laughs> than mm -hmm. we are now. Um, so perhaps we were too early. Um, but it was always something I was um, fascinated by. Uh, you know, the, the media and entertainment business is... Um, very exciting. Uh, it's really, really fun to be a part of. Uh, my first degree, actually, before I got a degree in, in music, was in film. Uh, oh, <laughs> so, such a renaissance, man! Wow. <laughs> and so, yeah, very, um, yeah, sort of, sort of coming back to uh, you know what it what it means to you know be tangentially you know connected yeah. to that, and what what skills do I have, you know, from you know performance marketing and, and digital and and, and product and go to market that could lend themselves, mm -hmm. uh, to the growth of streaming. And I, mm -hmm. and I kept hearing the same kinds of words that we used to say about mobile that like, it's, you know, it's on the precipice. It's about to happen. It's about to be measurable. We're about to have the unit economics figured out. Um, we're starting to see some early growth hacker type marketers have a lot of success here. They've been able mm -hmm. to optimize this in really powerful ways. They've got their CPAs down yep. uh, to the right numbers. You know, this is all starting to happen. Um, and so I honestly, I, I just reached out to Roku in particular. You, know, you I, invented I had, your own role. 
Yeah, there there wasn't a role. Um, I, I, you know, uh, I, I had a, had a deck and a dream, you know, and, um, <laughs> That's and awesome. some ideas of things that I would really love to help with. And, and I just reached out honestly, you know, and said that I, I want to help, you know, build and, um, you know, to the extent that you think that I could be useful, I'd, I'd love to be a part of it. And, uh, and yeah, that's been three years ago now. And, um, now leading our, um, uh, ad innovation practice that, uh, includes all of our new, you know, ad mm -hmm. units and our existing, you know, native ad units that live in our home screen and in our, our native environment and operating system It includes our action ads and shoppable ads that, um, uh, appear over the top of in-stream video. Yeah. Uh, and now it also includes our ads manager product, which is our self-service tool. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm up to. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And I mean, uh, there are few people, there are very few people who understand both kind of, uh, the detail of how the ad tech ecosystem works, but can also operate on a strategic level. So that's super, super, super valuable. And you've had great experience. So it's a great, great role for you. Amazing that you invented it. I mean, that's really cool. That's got to do it. <laughs> well, that. you know, I, I, everything is about timing and it just yes. happened to be that at that time, you know, some folks at Roku had already started talking about, Hey, we'd like to be investing in X, Y, and Z. We don't really have somebody to like, you know, focus on that. Um, this guy messaged us and <laughs> he might be interesting. Who is this um, dude? Do a background but also, check on him. <laughs> you know, our, 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 our VP of product, um, uh, Lokman Prampath really, uh, fostered this, right. And, and mm -hmm. really was the one that, um, believed that it would be valuable to have a, um, a CEO type leader to, you know, help establish some of these products and bring them to market. Yeah. And, yep. um, so, you know, it's a, it's always still about timing and people and all of these things. And, and I'm, I'm, yeah, very grateful that it worked out. It's been, it's been a blast. When the magic happens, uh, it is amazing. Absolutely. So I want to ask, um, maybe 30,000 foot level, you know, about the ads experience at Roku. And I'll give a bit of an intro to that because you have a lot of stuff going on, right? There's home screen ads, there's Roku city, there's theme spotlights, sponsored playlists, there's season passes, there's standard video ads, which is what most people think about when they think about CTV. Okay. I got my 32nd ad there. The timer's going down. Somebody's waiting to click, you know, um, you know, skip or they're waiting for it to finish so they can watch a thing. There's pause ads when you you pause the show and an ad comes up. There's action, interactive ads. Um, give us the whole picture of how that all fits together. Well, I'll build it from the bottom up. And in-stream video is the primary vehicle for advertising in CTV. Um, so that is what you're used to in television mm -hmm. where you have commercial breaks. Um, with CTV, there's some added features and capabilities that can come to that in terms of like how the ad pods work and how you can take over an ad pod or how you, you know, can create binge ad pods where, you know, you are the only you advertiser. Ad pod. What is an ad pod? Um, so that's the break, you know, in okay. your content, right? And so there, there might be, um, you know, three or four ads that get placed in that pod. Gotcha. Uh, for that period of time. And, you know, there might also be pre-roll you know, types mm -hmm. of ad pods where mm -hmm. we're showing, uh, the viewer an ad before they're viewing their content. And maybe that's a binge ad where by showing the consumer or viewer that ad, they don't have to watch ads for the rest of their program. Yep. So somebody's um, paid for that privilege ad free on us, you know, kind of thing, <laughs> right? So there's all kinds of things that can happen with that, but in general, it really is, you know, uh, video and video is, um, you know, by and large, the, the most impactful medium because television is a leaned back experience, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're sitting on your couch, you're looking to be entertained. Um, as a result, your mood is a little bit different. Um, you oftentimes are just a little bit more open. Um, you're not doom scrolling and like, you know, focusing on getting to the next <laughs> thing, right? You're just sort of sitting back and letting this happen. Um, so there's a lot of power of messaging there. Um, and of course it, within stream, uh, we can target, um, the user, you know, based on, you know, what we know about them at, at Roku, we can, um, you know, work with, uh, brands to build audiences. We mm -hmm. can also make sure we're excluding audiences that we want to exclude. We can do all those things that you would normally do in digital. And then, um, 
of course we can we can measure to outcomes you know uh you know of course one of the primary methods that is used today is ip address um mm -hmm. television is a little bit different in that we have a more persistent ip your tv doesn't go and move around the world uh it stays <laughs> in your living room uh, so it usually has the most current version of your IP address. Um, and then with Roku, we are able to do some things that are even more powerful in that we've got a logged in user. Mm -hmm. And because we have a logged in user and an IP address, you know, and we've continued to learn more about that, that viewer and that user in the household, we create a more persistent identifier of our own mm -hmm. uh, on the device. Uh, and uh, so, so, you know, in the cases where you may be hearing about duplicate IP addresses, you know, on certain networks uh, where there might be thousands of people that are sharing a single IP and that's mm -hmm. causing, you know, false attribution. Well, we can pare that down, you know, quite dramatically because of our identifier on our own device. Um, so you have all that stuff going on within stream and, and um, you can buy in stream directly with us, direct IO in stream video. You can, you can buy it. Uh, through third-party programmatic, so you could you know buy it through you know someone like the Trade Desk, uh, and then you can also buy it through uh, our own uh, self-service ads manager, mm -hmm. um, which feels looks and feels a lot like you know um, Meta or TikTok ads manager. Um, you log in, upload your creative, start running ads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and I would also say that in-stream video is sort of the most interoperable medium, you know, in CTV today. It's the one that, you know, if you have a video creative, you can yep. run a video creative in the spot and you might be able to do that from those three different access points that I just mentioned. Yeah. But then we have uh, our operating system and uh, the experience you have when you turn on your television and you're looking for the next thing you want to watch. Um, there is, a, I think, a known known that it's difficult to figure out what to watch next. Yes, it is. Everyone's quite frustrated <laughs> Paradox with of this. Choice. <laughs> um, you know, uh, people spend, you know, somewhere between 11 and 17 minutes trying to figure that out once they turn on the Roku devices. Um, so there's lots okay, of fine, I'll watch that thing I watched last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there's lots of clicking around, lots of browsing, there's searching, there's you know, all this behavior that's happening on television that's, um, you know, different than it was in linear where you were just channel flipping. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be a more informed decision. We'd like to think you, you probably will find things still faster than you would have with channel flipping back in the day. Uh, you just and maybe settled settle, back yeah, in the day. Yeah, maybe settle settled. less. Okay, yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> Our, yeah, yeah, the bar is higher uh, yeah. in terms of committing your time. And so in that whole experience of discovery, we do have, you know, advertising of various kinds. Of course, media and entertainment companies advertise in this space to show off, you know, their mm -hmm. next titles and um, what it is that they have to offer. Um, but also we have, um, you know, these large units. We've got a marquee unit right there mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. home screen that's tappable, uh, that you can do all kinds of things, Um once you have tapped on it as a viewer, uh, you know, whether that's sending yourself a text to, to make a purchase and go further down the funnel or watching, um, you know, more about a particular brand or product or exploring a showroom of products and uh, uh, sort of going into your, your own little mm -hmm. world with that brand. Mm -hmm. there, there's so many things that we can do from these different experiences. So the marquee ad, we have a spotlight ad, we have um, also Roku City. Mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, our screensaver, believe it or not. If you're not a Roku person, we have this screensaver <laughs> that uh, millions of people love and tweet about um, like every seven seconds. Uh, and <laughs> it is, uh, it's, a, it's a world that's you know, full of nostalgia and, and uh, little Easter eggs of entertainment. Um, it's something that was designed really just for our viewers to enjoy but it has captured so many uh, imaginations and, mm -hmm. and uh, such, such uh, uh, excitement uh, that, you know, brands wanted to participate and wanted to be a part of as well. So we actually have, you know, buildings and cars and billboards and things that exist with cool. Roku city cool. that, that advertisers can take part in. 
Um, so anyway, the, the, these uh, native ads experiences um, are you know found throughout. The, they are purchased through a direct IO. Yeah, they are bespoke. You know, they are. Um, it's got a fit. Not, yeah, they're they're not your um, you know typical programmatic ad units. Um, and in fact, our own visual quality design team is involved uh, in nearly all of these executions. Um, but there's a there's a there's a very large scale at this point. It's a it's a very meaningful uh, part of our business, and it's going to be a, a big part of our growth going forward. Very cool, very cool. I mean, there's so much there. I mean, because I mean, CDV is pretty new for many performance marketers, mobile marketers. In some cases, they're getting more familiar with it. I think 35, 45 percent of people on uh, last um, survey I did had had dabbled in it, dipped their toes into it. Not everybody has. Uh, but Roku is a different piece as well, right? Because, I mean, if you talk CTV, I mean, there's channels, right? And then there's platforms. Um, there's, there's, there's content providers. And you've got Ro Roku does all those different things, including hardware provision, right? Operating system provision, right? And then you've got players like Prime, uh, which, which encompass everybody wants to be the big star and then have everybody else's content flowing flowing for them as well. So it's a very complex environment right now. Yeah, I would agree. You know, the foundational advantage that Roku has is our device and our operating system. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in half of American households. Um, a lot of people don't realize that. Um, and it is still growing at a, a really phenomenal pace. Um, people, People love our devices. They love their simplicity. Uh, they buy lots of them, multiple of them, put them in all their homes, their vacation homes, you know. Um, and that's where it starts for us, you know, yeah. the fact that we have been given the trust, you know, to be in that position then allows us to explore how do we improve discovery, um, you know, both for viewers and for brands. Uh, and then how do we, you know, create a, uh, an experience that provides and adds a lot of value through that. And yes, mm -hmm. we, we produce our own content. We have a uh, Roku channel that um, we license content through. Um, and so we have lots and lots of free ad supported content that we provide. But at the same time, we are a platform that grows by the use of many different services and apps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what a lot of folks don't realize is that, you know, when, when you purchase a new subscription on your Roku device, we do take a percentage of that, those subscription dollars. Just right? like Apple, just yeah. like Amazon, just, just like, like Google. App store type of environment. Yep. Um, but it's also true for those that don't have a subscription, like an AVOD or, you know, advertising video on demand channel, um, we'll take a portion of their ad inventory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's how, when you're buying instrument video from Roku, uh, or through Roku, um, we're able to, of course, you know, bid and purchase inventory that's owned and operated by us, but also inventory that lives from within, you know, other app environments in the mm -hmm. OTT ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, cool. And it allows for us to do a lot of really, like, very direct and very price efficient uh, uh, kinds of buying for advertisers. Let's talk about measurability a little bit. Um, so you've done a variety of things. You already mentioned one, like, you know, text me this. Uh, so then it gets on a device. You can do something there. Obviously, there's the, um, the, the age old put up QR code, which interestingly enough, a marketer recently told me that, you know what, it doesn't get clicked on very much when we have it on there. There's actually more engagement with the ad unit um, for some crazy psychological reason, right? You've also announced an integration with Shopify, right? Shoppable ads and other things like that. So for performance marketers coming here and saying, hey, okay, I understand brand. I understand what I have been doing. I understand that you bought a lot of the addressability, the targetability, the audiences and stuff like that. And even the purchasability that I'm kind of familiar with in terms of uh, building out an ad portfolio. When I want to measure, what are my options? How does it look like? Well, um you know, it depends on what it is you're trying to measure. Um, but if you're a performance marketer, especially maybe in the mobile space, um, you know, work, working with an MMP is a great, you know, first step, making sure that you're, you know, attributing back 
um, the right kinds of conversions to the media itself. Um, CTV, because it's a television, you know, we do want to measure view through attribution. Mm -hmm. uh, its biggest impact is the view mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And that will remain the case, you know, for, you know, years to come. But the click through path is starting to establish and is starting to grow. Um, I thought it's interesting what you said that um, you heard the anecdote that by providing a click through path or a path to purchase on a video, it actually improves the overall video performance. And we've actually found the same thing to be the case. Um, so uh, just by adding the OK, press mm -hmm. OK to send yourself a text, whether they decided to send themselves a text or not. Uh, we see a higher influence um, Interesting. in sales lift. And so, you know, the next stage, of course, is to get into incrementality. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's what matters. And especially when you're dealing with a channel that has such an impact to top of funnel, um, looking at its incremental uh, impact to your sales is going to be the most powerful uh, way that you can assign value. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. So yeah, get, get the baseline right with just matching and attribution. And then from there, start to think about how is this impacting all of my channels? How is this, um, you know, where is it not getting credit where it should be getting credit and mm -hmm. you know, all of those sorts of things. And then, um, you know, maybe back on this click path, uh, I agree that QR codes don't work super well um, in terms of response rates. What's nice about a QR code is that when you do scan it, then you go straight to the website. So there's yep. no hops in between, right? But that scan rate looks like 0.044% percent <laughs> on a good day. That's that lean back experience. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's, it's also what we've learned from viewers is that, yes, they have their phone out. Mm -hmm. They do not want their phone doing TV things. Interesting. They are scrolling on TikTok. Uh, they are, uh, looking at stuff on Pinterest. They are doing other things. They don't want to be hopping around tabs in their browser or moving around between apps. They'd literally rather have their phone in one hand and grab the remote with the other. I'm so um, countercultural in that. I'm like, if I'm watching on the big screen, you know, let me just, this is what I'm doing right now. <laughs> okay. Just do one thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, exactly. that's even better. That's even better. Yeah. Um, uh, but you know, another thing about, you know, mobile phone, cause we have a mobile app and, and it's like, you know, very popular in terms of its use to be able to use that to mm -hmm. um, navigate your te television. But the remote is also just so, so much a part of the television viewing experience. It's what makes the TV a heads up viewing display, right? A heads yep. up display means I'm looking at something. I'm doing something else with my hands and I'm not looking at my hands while I'm exactly. doing it. Exactly. You know that remote, you know where the buttons are. You don't have to search for them, find them. You... And if you, and if you're tapping this on your phone, you're having to kind of like see where these are, right? Cause we don't have buttons on our phones anymore. Um, so there's, there's a tactical, you know, thing and a felt experience of like what it means to look at a big screen and, mm -hmm. and enjoy that, that the remote is just so helpful in. And so as we started building ad units where an overlay would come out over an in-stream video and say, press okay to, you know, learn more, buy now, um, we, you know, immediately saw baselines that were better than QR codes. And over time, as we continue to test these units, improve them, uh, optimize what they look like, how they show, how they come in, how long they stay, you know, all of these things, you know, we've gotten to the point where we see response rates up in the 1% level, right? So yeah. compared to a 0 .0, you know, for 0.02%, right? That response rate is so much higher. Yes. And that said, when you press okay on the remote, now what? Mm -hmm. It might be a few hops before you get to a conversion. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll see some drop off, you know, in that funnel but still conversions are four to five times higher than they would have been with QR yeah. codes yeah. because there are just so many more responses. Yeah. And what you're also getting with all those responses, even if they don't make a purchase now, you just got them to do something yeah. to connect with your brand, the odds that they're going to follow up, that they might buy in store, that they go online later. Um, if they did send themselves a text, maybe they didn't open and purchase it right now in the moment but 
they might go back and look at their texts, believe it or not. Text open rates are way, way, way higher than than email mm-hmm. and, and other me- and other mediums. So there's actually um, a lot of influence that happens in this response to your TV, mm-hmm. regardless of whether you purchase right now in the moment. Yeah. And I want to go back to something you said before. Uh, you talked about upper funnel and you talked about lower funnel. You said, believe it or not, not everybody is ready to buy right now. You know, mm-hmm. not everybody's ready to act right now. Mm-hmm. And that's critical. And the story that I, that always pops to my mind when I hear that is I was talking to a marketer and say, you know, we, we all want the apples. We all want the apples. We all want it. The immediate reward right now. Sometimes you got to plant the trees, <laughs> right? right? Sometimes you got to right. plant the trees and sure, mm-hmm. you know, you can, you can pick apples for a year, maybe even two years, maybe even three years, right? Eventually, at a certain size and at a certain scale, you're going to have to plant a few orchards. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that, that makes a lot of sense. I, I was speaking to a D2C marketer who has been wildly successful. And they you know, started out with a very specific demo. And it was very clear that they were going after this very specific demo of people. And they absolutely crushed it. You know, they, they just consume the earth within that demographic of people. Um, and then, and, and then it was sort of like a now, now what, <laughs> what, what do we do now? Like we've What's talked our to Tam? all, we've How talked we to grow all our those, Tam? Yeah. We've talked to all those people already, <laughs> you know? And so they started using television as a vehicle for finding and educating new audiences, figuring out who was interested enough to be educated, you know, at the top of the funnel and started planting trees, as you say, uh, in these other verticals. And that is what multiplied that business. By That's not the first time I've heard a story like that, because I've heard from many mobile marketers saying, you know, we're kind of tapped out. We're kind of, ta- you know, if we go to an SDK network, we can pretty much hit everybody, right? We can go to more of them, right? And put more mm-hmm. fishing poles in the same river, right? Mm-hmm. But if we want to actually diversify, we need to look at other platforms. And so that's one of the reasons why CTV has been a big one there. I do want to talk about your integration with Spotify. I don't know that that's Shopify, huge yet. Yes. Or any shop, <laughs> Shopify, thank you, thank you. We also have a great <laughs> partnership with Spotify, but it's a different different thing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Shopify. Uh, I don't know that that's huge yet, um, but I, just as I think about live stream shopping, which is massive in Asia and other places and stuff like that, as I think about where I think Amazon will go with Prime and the vast array of products that they have, and I think about just, you know, I want to do some shopping and I want to see some stuff. Shopify is massive. There's a lot of stores on there. you got an integration there. How do you see that functioning? Well, um, you know, first of all, we wanted to make it easy for Shopify advertisers to buy television uh, and to be able to utilize the data that they already have, um, both for targeting and, and for measurement and attribution. And so, you know, the integration that we did with Shopify helps to make that just push button and simple and ready to go. Um, we also, though, wanted to add more of that bottom of the funnel action and engagement that we were talking about earlier. And so we um, built the ability to be able to purchase on screen, you know, through your TV, literally just press OK. We pre-populate with your mm-hmm. credit card details that we have on file with Roku Pay and your shipping address. Place order by pressing OK. Um, you get an email from, you know, the Shopify store. Uh, that confirms it and says when your item's going to arrive and talks about warranty information and all the important things. Um, but that's it. It's it's simple. And what it's like I, making an in-app purchase, right? The double click there. <laughs> that's that's right, right. And and I find that you know today that is more of a um, uh, a consumer focused product. Uh, mm-hmm. The consumer that really wants to make the purchase now and wants to do something right away is sort of frustrated that that doesn't exist on Mm -hmm. television. And so there's a surprise and delight that happens today when this is not commonplace and they get excited about it. They might tweet about it and talk about it. Um, In that way, it's, it's more of a, you know, we, we, it's almost like we built it for them first Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you do see purchase activity that comes through it, 
But what you see that we mentioned earlier is that because of all this engagement, because of the curiosity, because of the tapping and looking around, spending time with your brand, we see sales lift in general go up yeah. and especially go up compared to what an unassisted in-stream video would look like. Um, so there's just so much more value that you're capturing in this funnel and so much more you can optimize toward. And, uh, and we're seeing really phenomenal CPAs you know, for cool. Shopify merchants that are turning on this feature. Cool. It's almost like a call to action matters. Hey, I mean, like who, <laughs> who, yeah. know, who knew? Really? Well, and also, so what a lot of people don't realize is that this is the first time that you could just sign up with a credit card, start running TV ads and do an integration like this where the purchase happens on TV. Yeah. Like, you know, the, you know, purchase on TV or T-commerce, like sorts of things have been done and tried in lots of different ways over many years. They've always been, managed service. Mm -hmm. They've always taken weeks or months to put into place. Mm -hmm. They usually are campaigns that are run over a quarter or more where you get a wrap report, you know, in the next quarter, On PDF. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so what this does is puts it in the hands of marketers that are the true grow growth hackers mm -hmm. that can put you know, 10 campaigns against each other and, mm -hmm. uh, vary their creative and vary their, uh, experience and really find what's working and turn campaigns on and off and alternate yeah. and do, um, all kinds of different kinds of audiences. And, you know, this just lets them play and go for it, you know, yeah. run something for a day, turn it off, do something different. Yeah. Uh, and that just hasn't been possible in CTV at all. So that, that's what I'm most excited about is that Shopify merchants can just do whatever they want. Just, just go. And there's no like minimum commitments or, yeah. you know, anything like that. There's so many pieces to that that are interesting, right? Like you say, no minimum commitments. You can start, you're very small. You can go for it. You can pick a certain area and go for that, right? You can test a few things and you can stop. It really democratizes access. It's super interesting for the super small shop. And you know what? I think it's going to be very interesting for the big brand that can probably get that direct purchase immediately because they have the the reputation, the Nikes of the world and stuff like that. Oh, that's the new one. I always get the new one. I know Nikes. I like them. Boom. There we go. Right. So I think there's a huge possibility for a future for that. Um, and I'm excited to see how that grows. I do want to hit, and we don't have a lot of time left. I do want to hit a couple of verticals for mobile, for mobile, and just get your like top of the top of the mind. Here's what I think. Uh, so I come to you, and I'm a casual game. What do I do? Does is this the shop? Uh, does does Roku have a place for me? Absolutely. Um, you know, depends on what it is you're trying to accomplish. I want to make money. Um, but if you want to, if you want to build a new evergreen channel, mm -hmm. right, you, you want to, you want to replicate what you've done in other channels. You want uh, something that can be always on that will continue to drive return on ad spend. Then starting with in stream is definitely the way to go. Um, either that's going to be in third party programmatic, or that's going to be with our ads manager directly. Mm -hmm. um, if you're just getting started, you know, I'm biased, but I definitely think you should try out the ads manager because you can start at whatever level, make sure you put your measurement in place, um, you know, with our events API or with an MMP, uh, and start to, you know, run campaigns and see what your cost per insp install, you know, baselines look like, mm -hmm. um, and optimize from there. Cool. I will say that creative is going to be the linchpin at the end of the day. This is a messaging platform. Mm -hmm. And so I encourage, say, you know, if you're a casual games marketer, I encourage you to be creative and really, you know, uh, think hard about this. Think about mm -hmm. what assets do you have that are working? Mm -hmm. um, what partnerships or connections do you have that are inspiring or interesting? Are there influencers that are, you know, playing your game on Twitch that you could convert some of that into something really interesting on, on the big screen? You know, what's going to capture attention? What's mm -hmm. going to get mm -hmm. people to, to, to be intrigued and do something. Yeah. Um, and so setting a baseline with maybe whatever you have, whatever you're doing on YouTube or whatever, but realizing that that's just a baseline and there's a lot of room to grow when it comes to the creative that you're going to bring in 
and you don't need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars producing this creative. In fact, I suggest you don't. <laughs> um, do something far more efficient so that mm -hmm. you can test creative you know, mm -hmm. against itself and mm -hmm. start to make improvement. Does it change if I'm mid core, maybe a hardcore, maybe I'm a, you know, a game that, you know, people come in and they spend five years in there, right? Maybe 10 years or something like that. And they spend 5,000, 10,000 to, you know, exponentially more. Does it change anything to your answer? If I'm that person, mid core, hardcore gaming? Yeah. I think one thing I didn't mention, um, for the, the casual side is that I would probably also start with broad targeting and mm -hmm. let our ML find, uh, the likely converters on your behalf. Um, when you know a lot about your audience and your audience is very high spending, then there's obviously a lot of efficiency you can get in targeting that audience more clearly, more specifically, um, mm -hmm. whether that's, you know, bringing in a first party audience, um, to, uh, to build up, um, the, the right targeting. We also have targeting across various console games. Um, you know, because of our ACR data, we're able to see, you know, console gaming play behavior on the platform. And so maybe there are some, uh, some target audiences that match up, cool. um, with, with console titles. Um, and then, you know, we also, you know, can look at, you know, the inputs of devices, you know, is this mm -hmm. person played mm -hmm. Xbox, PlayStation, you know, those kinds of things. Nice. Um, so you can start to build, um, more sort of laser, you know, targeted methodology, if you really, really know who you're going after. But even for those, I would say, we always recommend trying some broad targeting as well and letting our ML go and find Sometimes likely you don't spenders. Know. Sometimes you, what you think you know, obscures you from learning what you don't know, you don't know. The, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. About. Yeah, there yeah. are likely pockets you haven't thought about. And so, you know, we do recommend that. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, a lot of the same cool. know, principles apply. Cool. We talked a lot about retail, so I won't hit that. Let's say I'm fintech or something like that. Uh, what's the what's the space for me on on Roku? Um, yeah, financial services and and fintech apps are definitely some of our early adopters um, for the Roku Ads Manager. Um, you usually have a, a pretty clear. Um, LTV defined, and that's connected to, you know, a verified, you know, uh, sign up or credit card application or whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we've done really well, um, working with those kinds of advertisers that are optimizing toward those conversion events. Yeah. Um, I would say for those, they love to send all kinds of events to figure out, um, how both how they might optimize, but also, you know, what is their, uh, effective spend to LTV, mm -hmm. um, and, and allowing our ML to, to do a better job of that. Um, you know, in financial services, it also depends on, you know, what sort of age groups and demos are you going after and making sure your targeting is effective there. Um, I do think that matters, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and in some cases, you know, uh, you know, you would think the obvious thing is, you know, target people that are interested in financial news and, you know, things like that. And, uh, for a lot of fintech products that have grown and had a lot of success in the last several years, their audience is actually the opposite of that. Exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. not someone that watches any Unbanked, news about perhaps. financial. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that's definitely a, a, a very fast, you know, growing category for us. Cool. Cool. Maybe here's the place to land the plane. Um, you started off and you said, Hey, you know, there's some interesting things happening, but we're still very early days in CTV ads. Talk about how you see it evolving over the next couple quarters next year. Well, um, you know, I mentioned this before, but it is the, uh, solution solutioning around access. Uh, just making it easy for marketers to run anything anywhere, you know, and try as much as they want or can afford to. Um, mm -hmm. That's just something that's brand new that mm -hmm. hasn't really existed in television. And um, I think those that really commit to it and get aggressive about it are going to see outsized impacts early on. Um, there's so much, you know, supply availability and there's so much, um, 
there, there's still so much opportunity in, in ML and optimization that those that get moving early are going to reap the rewards. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that does mean, you know, thinking about creative, it does mean mm -hmm. thinking about what's going to really connect audiences and have a performant impact. Um, so yeah, just, just start playing, you know, and growth <laughs> hacking. And, uh, and I think those that are, I mean, that's what we've seen the last two quarters and, and that's been, you know, marketers in the, in the hundreds, mm -hmm. uh, I think over the next couple of quarters, you'll start to see that in the thousands. Very cool. Well, Peter, thank you for taking this time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, really enjoyed it.